Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm Pruitt. This is my esteemed colleague, Jim Davis of the defense. Prosecution has made its case quite known, um, but the longer that we sit with the evidence, it is quite clear that there is a kind of magic to this book. So let's gather around in defense of Ravnica. Okay, Jim, we're Dungeon Masters here. Yeah, yeah. I got this book, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Oh, yeah. I haven't had a chance to really look through it. Mm. Not that much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, sell me on Ravnica. Yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, fifth edition books. Bold uh, statement. Yeah, I, I really like it. We'll just start out with a bang. I really hope that most of the setting books uh, that they put out, or any others that they put out, are in this vein because I find it to be eminently useful as a dungeon master, and way more so than uh, more traditional uh, fantasy settings or setting books that role-playing games have. And I've already used it to, to run a couple of one-shots, and, mm -hmm. and it's the more I use it, the more I like it, and the more I find in it that is useful. We're not gonna review Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. It's not a first impressions or anything. Instead, we're here really to talk about what is it that makes this book unique, mm -hmm. and what is it that you can get out of this book uh, if you're willing to sort of like set aside what you think this product should have been, if that makes any sense, well, right? Yeah, I mean, it did, it did get uh, it did get some uh, negative uh, yeah, review well, well, initially. Well, right? Initially, right? Well, I mean, there was always difficulty with the product, I guess, <laughs> when it was announced because either they don't want to see the crossover, they they like the two. Magic the Gathering and and D &D's kept separate, mm -hmm. or you know any number of reasons. There are people who are like, well, you know, there's all these other settings in D and D that could come out. Like, why choose this one? And when I was looking at that, I was like, yeah, we already have those settings, right? Like, I know there's a strong desire to have a everything updated for every edition of D and D, and that's exhausting, right? <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there for D and D, and and. I would much rather see something fresh and new and different because we've already got Planescape, we've already got Spelljammer, we've already got Dark Sun. Painful as it is to not see new books on the shelf for those, we've got those available. Uh, this is something new, something different. Um, mm -hmm. And then they also went and did something different with it in terms of format. And so, like, it was a for me, it was a double whammy. I was like, oh my god, I'm, I was happy they were doing, uh, you know, a, a Magic: The Gathering setting. Yeah. Uh, Ravnica is really awesome in that respect, and then for it to be such a useful book was like, I love this. Like, I this is really great. So okay, yeah. well, I tell you what, let's breeze through a quick overview. Sure. Okay. And then yeah, uh, yeah. dig down on a couple points that you uh, that you really like. So, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica is uh, six chapters. They're roughly can be broken up into three sections. Um, and they are a, a player-facing section, which is chapters one and two, character creation, the guilds of Ravnica, that kind of thing. Uh, the introduction in chapter three contain most of the lore of the setting. It's not a lot, but it is enough. And then four, five, and six are mostly dungeon master-oriented chapters, where it's like creating adventures and monsters and magic items, things like that. If you'd like a full review, uh, I did write up <laughs> a review on InWorld. We'll put a link to it into the uh, in, in our uh, description. I loved this book so much that when I was like looking at the reviews on InWorld for it, I was like, I gotta make like log in and write write one of my own. Um, and it, it's more of, got more mixed reviews now. Initially, it seemed like they were really negative. Um, and I, I think part of that stems from what the book isn't. Right, this is mm -hmm. not a traditional setting supplement like you might be used to. It's not deep lore. We don't really dive into the setting, the 10,000 year history of Ravnica as a planar city. There's nothing really like that. The introduction has a brief overview of, of the city uh, and its history and the guilds, their place in it. And then chapter three has uh, more lore and it's scattered throughout the book. This isn't a lore book. And if you're looking for like say, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, yeah. right? Not that. But it's enough to at least get uh, a flavor of the setting, right? It is. And it's not as if this lore isn't available online at, on, like, say, the Magic the Gathering wiki and other places. So it's enough that if you are willing to take liberties with the setting and to do some work to tease it out and, and flesh it out, or if you just happen to know about it from Magic the Gathering and the lore there, uh, then there's enough. But it's also an asset, right? You don't have to read through a lot of fluff to get to what's useful. You get enough of it to understand what the flavor of the thing is, how it should be portrayed, where they fit into you know, the setting, how it works together. But the details of it, uh, how it exactly works, is still left up for grabs. And I, I think that's an asset because it allows each uh, table to adapt 
to what they want to use from this mm -hmm. book. And then the other thing it's not is it's not an overhaul of the D&D &D magic system. And that's kind of what I was hoping for. I was really oh, hoping that they would like... the colors uh, and With that. the colors and, and, and sort of like mana and, and all that. And I, at first I was disappointed by that. And I'm still kind of disappointed that there's not more magic in it. That there's not more unique spells, that there's not more custom, uh, um, you know, magic, custom magic rather. I mean, the game's not called Setting the Gathering. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there's one new spell, yeah. uh, which is a really cool cantrip, uh, and then some magic items that are uh, drawn from Magic the Gathering, but it's not like they made up a whole bunch of spells based on um, the, uh, the various Ravnica blocks. Mm -hmm. And I've seen less people sort of um, addressing that, and more it seems to be the common complaint is it's not a traditional role-playing setting book. And for people who want to dive deep into the lore and wanted this to be their primer for it and this to be their introduction, that they're really wanting more out of it. And that's if that's what you're looking for, then this book is not for you. And that's kind of what I said. Like, if you're willing to accept this book for what it is, get rid of what you thought it should be or, or the fact that it exists in the first place, mm -hmm. and just sort of be like, listen, there's some great ideas in here and an amazing implementation and it is like I said imminently useful as a toolbox for your uh, for making adventure set in the campaign so what are some of the highlights for you mm, yeah. uh, in, in in this book the, the big ideas the big highlights the things that I love about it are the treatment of backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, to me backgrounds are a part of fifth edition that I felt has lagged behind we get the ones that are in the player's handbook some advice on creating them in the dungeon master's guide uh, most of the adventures had a couple of options for backgrounds in them, and then Sword Coast Adventures got expanded on them. But it's often been one of those things that, you know, the Dungeon Master has to, like, tease it out and bring it out. And, and there's a lot of things you, as a Dungeon Master, you can do with the background that, that I really like them for. But in terms of, like, making it uh, mechanically significant, you know, there are two extra skills and maybe a language and, and some features, right? Like... It's not that much. Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica takes the factions that are in, presented in the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide and the ranks that you get based on renown and things like that and ties that to a background and adds on an expanded spell list that represents the sort of core spells that are a part of that guild. Right, so there are 10 guilds in uh, Ravnica and they range from the sort of like the Azorius who are, who are sort of like lawful, goodish types who sort of run the city and, and provide the sort of functioning government of the city. Yeah. Um, but they also tend to be, they also seem to be portrayed as rather unbending and, and, and sort of uh, rigid uh, in their outlook. Uh, from those all the way to like people that live in the, the sewers and, and, and literally create corpse rations <laughs> for the people to eat and, and deal with decay and death. And, but they serve a vital function in the city in, in that they sort of keep the whole thing, or keep part of it uh, running. And so each one of the 10 guilds has a place in the city. They're a part of the infrastructure, the running of it, the, 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 the whole machinery of the city. And all of that's tied into the background choice, which is your guild, right? You become mm -hmm. uh, an Azorius law mage or a Boros legionnaire or a Demir agent or something. The fact that it ties the magic, which they're presented like um, war, uh, Warlock's expanded spell list, right? these options are now available for you to select if you want. The ones that I've run, I've gone ahead and said, well, maybe they work more like domain spells. And you always have these prepared. I tried that once and then it ended up with like paladins with cantrips, <laughs> things like that, which was like interesting and unique and, and different, but I don't think I'd do that uh, again. Each background literally gets like three or four pages which have tables for uh, the usual personality tables and bonds, ideals and flaws, things mm -hmm. like that, but also contacts, people that you know. It's not yeah. just just in your guild, but, uh, but apart from your guild. Uh, it, it's got advice for how to portray uh, the different classes that would be a part of these particular guilds and really like digging in. In a way that maybe the player's handbook, it would have been inappropriate to do there, right? Like we don't need as much info on the different backgrounds as we do on the, each class. Right, for, yeah. for the introductory book for the game. But it, it's a nice expansion of it because it really shows you how background can, can color a character and can bring something out. And if you've got an organization in your world that, say, a mage's guild or a, a band of druids who protect a certain area, then using this as sort of a, a template for it is a way to, to make that background shine. And yeah. I've already done this from the backgrounds I created in Lamb Between Two Rivers, where I'm like, oh yeah, they would have an expanded spell list. The members of the fellowship would, you know, this is how they spread their magic, is by teaching it to anyone who will you know, yeah. join their ranks. It really gives them a, a reason to take something other than Outlander. 
Right, exactly, right? <laughs> and so, uh, certainly in a wasteland setting. Yeah. Uh, but it, on top of that, so you have the background, usual background benefits. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, you know, a feature, uh, some skills and the like, uh, the expanded spell list, and then you also have automatic enrollment in one of the guilds, which provides faction rank benefits. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's just this total package that you can see as the characters progress. And if you had a campaign that lasted a while, you might have characters that have whole like platoons of, of, of underlings that they can order around, and and uh, you know, a, an organization's worth of resources to marshal to their uh, cause and whatever it is that they're trying to do. They're not these lone solitary adventure adventurers that uh, you know are divorced from the the society yeah. and world around them. They're embedded in it, and yeah, because from the, beginning. from the beginning, right, and because the guilds are a part of the setting, all of it ties into the fact that oh, right, as they rise through the ranks, then the level of uh, of sort of like interaction with the city that they have is going to change. The their impact on the city is going to change, and I just absolutely love it. Like the the first time cracking it open and reading the the that section of character creation where they're digging into the backgrounds, I was like. Holy crap! Like this, you could build an entire style of, of of campaign based on what they've done with backgrounds here. And so, to me, it's the first like big idea. And mm -hmm. man, I hope we see more of, of of these sort of expanded backgrounds in other, other adventures. I wish that the faction agent from Sword Coast Adventures Guide got the same treatment that these did, because I feel like I know way more about. Um, the factions as background choices for them, uh, for these guilds than I do about, say, the, the factions from Forgotten Realms, where mm -hmm. it's like, I know about the Harpers because I've read some Forgotten Realms novels, yeah. but I couldn't tell you much about what, what a high-ranking Harper gets up to or, or yeah, yeah. kind of resources they have at their disposal. That right, kind of but it sounds like factions are pretty important. Yeah, they are absolutely important, uh, and, and they are the driving thing behind the game, which sort of brings me to, uh, to the second point, is the factions themselves. And whether you are uh, sort of inspired by the high magic, uh, ecumenopolis type uh, setting of, uh, of Ravnica, where it's like a, an entire plane that's a city, that's also a world, you know, the cosmology of the world is very different than D&D, &D and uh, you know, you'll have to adapt to that. But if you just zoom in on the, uh, on the guilds, you find that you've got uh, ready-made organizations. Mm -hmm with like NPCs, monsters, magic items, and spells associated with them already fleshed out. Mm -hmm. You wipe the serial numbers off and you drop them into your campaign world. And in terms of just having that ready-made and right there and also uh, an option for the players to become involved with it, with it is like a huge thing. It, it, it's, it, they're unique pieces to add to your other uh, mm -hmm. worlds. And so I, I love that fact about them, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I was just thinking about you know, as you describe what Ravnica really is, just an endless city, people having to eat the dead just for <laughs> rations. Right. And I'm just like, that sounds like Judge Dredd. I mean, there's in, like, in some ways, yeah, sure. Like, yeah. yeah, you know, you know. You, An Azorius law mage. You, yeah, you <laughs> dial back the fantasy just a little bit. Yeah. And you could totally, it sounds like you could totally use this to run a Judge Dredd D&D campaign. I mean, you certainly could. And, and you could use Ravnica. Ravnica would be eminently useful in an Eberron game. Yeah. Right, like there's so much in this book. I think because Ravnica and Eberron are, they're, they swim in the same pool, right? They're kind of steampunkish. They're very high fantasy. Yeah. They, they take magic and the impact on society pretty seriously. And so there's a lot there. You could model, say, the Dragonmark houses based on the guilds. Now, I know that Wayfarer's Guide to Eberron is doing its own thing with Dragonmarks and I'm excited for that as well, but if, you, if you're not into that and you only want to buy this one, then you could use that, you know, or you've mm -hmm. already got an Eberron game and, you know, you want a, a hardcover book because you're not a digital person, you know, uh, right, right. then you might use these until the, the hardcovers of Eberron come out whenever they do. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's sort of one way. The other way is using them in the Ravnica setting to power a campaign. The, the fact that there are so many options and tools and, and tables provided for you to put these pieces together and continue to use them. You could easily have a game that's driven by guild intrigue and politics and and is about these scrappy low-level faction or, or, you know, or guild agents who are, are, are struggling their way up the ladder until eventually they displace the leaders of these guilds and, and take over themselves. And, you would do to Ravnica what you would to any other published campaign setting and just make it your own and run your own games in it. The structure that these 10 guilds provide 
it, it's sort of like um, the concept of a mega dungeon as a, a tent pole to the campaign. The, the mega dungeon is what you do if you don't know what else you're going to do today when you're playing. You know, it's like nobody has a thing they need to do in town or visit in the wilderness. Well, then we'll do a delve. And so it's the same with Ravnica, where you're like, okay, none of the players have anything they particularly want to do today. Let me roll up the tables, see what the guilds bring up. Mm -hmm. You know, what do their superiors ask of them right now? Uh, what, what do, uh, you know, what, what things do they hear that they might want to proactively deal with in order to gain uh, some sort of prestige or reputation with their guild? Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can, can play this, and the fact that there's so much on the guilds so much offered really gives you a lot of tools to do that. And that's, that's why I love them. You've almost got me sold. All right, uh, so here's the big one. And the here, big one. Here is the one that sold me. Okay, there is a section in there. So far, mostly what we've talked about is in the first two chapters of the book. Um, I skipped over most of chapter three with the uh, setting info um, and really just read it when I need to you know, set up a one-shot or something. Chapter four was the chapter that uh, when I looked at it, I, I immediately grabbed my dice because it is the chapter that contains tables for each guild as well as a set of generic tables for generating adventures in this setting. And it's such a way that uh, I sat down with his dice and within 30 minutes had an adventure to run. And this was within an hour of opening the book. And there's very few, I can't say that about any of the published adventures for 5th edition. I can't say that about most RPG products uh, outside of the OSR. There are some OSR products where I literally can sit down, crack open the book, and start playing it within, you know, within the hour of reading it. And Ravnica was like that. Yeah. Um, you start out by uh, determining what guild that you want to uh, feature. And it doesn't necessarily need to be guilds that are the part of the, uh, the party, but they are guilds that you want to highlight or, or use, whatever. So for the first one I rolled up, it was like a, a Demir agent was attempting to blackmail someone. And immediately it was like, obviously it's one of the PCs. Um, and they're attempting to do that by implanting false memories of crimes in, um, in the minds of officials and the like. And so immediately, I'm, that's just a result of one roll on a table. And then it sort of ballooned from there into like, okay, wait a second. And now the... Uh, that, you know, they're being pursued by the Azorius who want them for these false crimes and it's linked to a, a Arachdos plot which could, uh, you know, have further consequences and the tables in there which add complications and connections to other guilds and, and uh, what you can do with the locations for the sample maps that they provide. And again, this is for each of the ten guilds plus the set of generic tables meant that there was um, a lot of fodder for me to build an adventure with. Yeah. And the entries on the tables are not generic. They're not like, you know, it, the closest thing to it is like chapter three of the DMG, but the tables in the DMG are very generic. They're, they're sort of like, oh, your villain could be doing this, or this could be the plot of the scenario that you want to introduce. Whereas the ones in Guildmaster's Guide are very much deeply immersed in the lore of Ravnica. And uh, when you combine the adventure creation tables and, and get your adventure outline and, and sort of like, at least your villain, what it is is your villain's plot. And then there will be holes in it where it's like, uh, you know, they contact this NPC or see this person or whatever. That's when you turn back to the player section and see the contacts that they would get from their guild and you plug those in. And then you go to say the section where they detail the 10th district and the six precincts in it. And you go like, oh, I see that this district has a lot of, say, this guild activity there. I'm going to use that. And it's just useful. Like, yeah. I, like I, I, it seems like such a low bar, <laughs> you know, for, <laughs> for, uh, what, <laughs> you know, for an RPG product. But I, there, think about this for a minute, folks. Mm -hmm. How many RPG products do you purchase and you flip through them when you get them and then you never crack them open again? It they a lot. never get used. And it doesn't matter if it's like for a game that you're playing a lot of or, or a game that you play like a one-shot of. There's so many RPG books where you, you collect them, essentially. You're not really mm -hmm. using this in, in, in the style of a game book. And I don't see that happening for me with Ravnica because everything in it, every page, is for, and it's also just beautiful, right? The art in it's great because it's got Magic the Gathering art and that's mm -hmm. some of the best art, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, that's out there and um, fantasy art at least. And so um, I, I can't speak on the CR and balance of the monsters. I've used a few of them. Uh, I like the, the there's a demon that, uh, that has an aura that causes uh, creatures to fight each other. 
And so I, I used that for uh, as a feature yeah. uh, featured villain of, for one of the one shots I ran, which was the Rakdos were trying to lure a bunch of Boros uh, legionnaires to a nightclub where the bloodshed that they would inevitably uh, spark off <laughs> would be used to summon and awaken one of these demons. And lo and behold, uh, that's what happens. Uh, and then, like everybody in the nightclub, is knives out and they start purging each other. So. <laughs> Uh, it just, and, you know, it's like it, that was after a, a that was after a romp through the undercity and and dodging uh, Orzov, uh, you know, agents who were after the uh, party. And the tables made distinctly Ravnican adventures, and I didn't have to do anything to make them Ravnican. They just were. For all of the one shots that I prepped for it, every time I've come back to the book, I've found something new I can add to bring the world to life to. Uh, to make this adventure interesting and and part of the particular setting, and so while it's a distinctly D and D game, yeah. right? They none of the underlying assumptions of D and D are changed. You're you're you could bring a you know player's handbook entirely created player's handbook uh, class and race into the game and would be fine. You, if you use the tools in Guildmaster's Guide, you'll get a a sort of a distinctly Ravnican game. And that's what I love about it. And that's what made me, that's what makes me say, like, I hope they are all like that. I hope when we finally get a Planescape game, it is in this style. I, we don't need the lore of it, right? Like, that's other places and in PDFs and, and old, you know, old game books that you can find somewhere. What you need is something that's going to give you the tools to create the thing yourself. Yeah. Right. In the same way that, say, those chapters in Out of the Abyss, so you know, you can use to run just any generic Underdark game, or those chapters in Storm King's Thunder that just detail what's in the North of the Forgotten Realms. You can use for whatever you want. This is a whole book of that, and that is why I, I, it's my favorite one uh, mm -hmm. so far. Not without its drawbacks, but um, what it offers is is great, and I love it. So what I'm hearing is Jim Davis loves Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica because he can use it. Because yeah. it's useful. Because it's useful, yes. Yeah. And I, like I said, I'm, I wish that that wasn't such a novel thing. But I'm, there are a lot of RPG products where when I get them, and, I, and, and they might be interesting, they might be full of great ideas, it might be just a, a solid game book, but because of the way it's presented or uh, the focus uh, of the book itself, um, it, it's not particularly useful. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean useful in the sense of does it help me run a game? Does yeah. it make my life easier when I run a game? Does it make the prep easier? Does it make what I need to do for the game better? Does it save me time? And most campaign setting books, the answer to that question is no. In fact, it might add a lot of time because I've yeah. got to search for what's interesting through pages and pages of deep lore or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, any closing thoughts there? I'd like to touch a bit on some of the criticisms okay. of it uh, because they are valid and they need to be uh, considered. You know, if you are looking for that deep lore, this isn't that book, like we said earlier. There's other things I think that the the, uh, the book could have done a better job of sort of walking us through. And part of that is just what to do with guilds, what to do with a party that doesn't necessarily have a, a guild makeup that seems compatible. And while I can see, say, a, a girl barbarian and a Boros paladin, you know, palling it up for, you know, a, a one-shot or something, it's harder to see that working out in the long term without, uh, without you sort of like really breaking the setting premise, which is that the Grohl are these anti-civilization sort of, uh, you know, they, they bring uh, destructive forces to bear because they sort of like see this whole edifice as unnatural and needs to be torn down. And then the Boros are like, oh no, we're, you know, we're, we're here to stop you from doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see how they might be allied temporarily, but I, I wish that there had been, um, a greater discussion on on how different parties can be made up from different guilds. There's a table that suggests some different uh, combinations, but getting them to fit and work together and a bit more discussion on that would have been nice. Um, particularly as some of the guilds don't really fit with D&D's traditional uh, heroic uh, narrative, right? Yeah. Like the, the do-gooder who, who sort of like rights wrongs regardless of the consequences. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we you, do good or it does good. <laughs> right. You have literal demon worshippers as player options. You know, you have uh, you know agent, you know spies who steal memories and alter people's you know minds to you know get what they want out of them. And, and, and you know they're not necessarily uh, heroes, but they are important to the setting. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is like it, it asks a lot of the dungeon master, and I can see new DMs being put off by a product like this uh, because it it does require so much. I'm of the opinion that if they're interested, they should try it out because 
what this will do is show them uh, a way that they can prepare their own adventures. And you know, if you're a, if you're a DM who's just sort of starting out, if your only model for how to run a game is the um, big damn quest model, like a lot of the adventures that have been put out provide. Uh, something like this might seem jarring, but it could also be a useful tool for training you to think in other ways, to prep adventures in other ways, to approach the game in different ways. So that's something to consider. But it, it, you're gonna have to do a lot of work for it, right? You're gonna have to put all these pieces together. Um, it's the difference between you know buying a, a Lego set that's about one thing and just buying the box of bricks. Guildmaster's Guide is a box of bricks as opposed yeah. to a thing you're gonna make. Yeah. The criticism that I have that I that I think is the lack of new spells, and I really think like they're doing so many other things with this game and and, and taking fifth edition and, and what it can do in new directions that it would have been great to see uh, at least a new spell per guild. Something yeah. iconic and new and, and maybe very different from what the other spells provide. Like the, the encoded uh, thoughts, uh, which is the cantrip, is way different than anything else in the player's handbook, right? It takes a, a thought that you uh, perceived in another person's mind and makes it a physical thing that you can trade and pass around. And if someone has detect thoughts, they can read that encoded mm -hmm. thought as well. It's like great for spies and intrigue and, oh, yeah. and all that kind of thing. And it would be great to have, say, uh, you know, a cantrip or low-level magic spell for each of the guilds. Or, you know, th there's also not many class options, right? There's uh, two new classes, Order, Domain, and Circle of Spores. And I know that, say, Brute Fighter and School of Invention Wizard were supposed to be, or, or seemed like they were in, meant for Ravnica, and the uh, heat that they got meant that they're not included. Uh, School of Invention ended up as a magic item, actually. You yeah. wear it and can then access those powers that you would get. Um, and I think that that's a shame because while I wasn't like super impressed with School of Invention, I really liked Brute Fighter. I liked that it was different enough from Champion, even though they're kind of overlap. Mm -hmm. And I would have preferred to have seen them try to make those work rather than abandon them. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's kind of, that sucks. And the same way with like spells, right? Like it would have been nice to have seen uh, more spells and, and, and something different and, and, and interesting in that regard and not like, oh, we're not going to do that because we don't want to, I don't know. And then I guess, you know, there's six new races which are interesting, but, you know, uh, they're, not for, uh, they're not for every campaign, right? They're very particular to Ravnica, and so mm -hmm. they might not be as useful or interesting um, if you're not into this kind of setting. I've, so. I mean, I've played a couple of Loxodon. I like the Loxodon, yeah. They're fun. A, having a drunken monk Loxodon is <laughs> yeah. a lot of drunken matron. <laughs> yeah, so th those parts of it, the character classes and the like, uh, are interesting, uh, you know, particularly the the trunk for a Loxodon, and uh, I like, it's pretty useful, but that it's not so much a book for players. This is really a DM-oriented book, and yeah. while if you're playing in a Ravnica game, you might find this really useful and, uh, to have. If you're just like a D&D &D player and you're looking at the book and going like, should I get it? Maybe, you know, it, it, they might have something in there, but most of this is, uh, is Dungeon Master oriented. So, mm -hmm. yeah, big criticism, huh? Wow. Jeez. But you give it your steel, your your steel, your seal of approval. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I really, uh, really head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast. So much more. Red DM is also on Twitch. Three new games, which we upload. Red DM plays our second YouTube channel. H B C B. When they're, when they're good. When they're good. When an HBCB is good. And I mean, first off, like an HBCB is like an orange, right? Like it's when an orange is good, it's the best fruit I've ever eaten. Full stop. It's the juiciest, the most succulent, the most freshest. It just feels like, my God, the bounty of this earth is enough for all of us. And we should be satisfied with the fruit of our hands and the work of our strong backs. You know, that kind of like connection uh, and everything. But let's be honest, that's about one out of every 10 orges is like that. And most of the rest of them are these dry, pulp, like what is, or I have to spend 10 minutes with the pulp and the pith and everything. Even and if you just, the seed, see, or even if you cut them up and you just like brute force your way, uh, and, you know, and you just use a knife, you know, you're, I, 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 anyway, HBCBs like that. And in that, when it's good, 
it's the best thing you've ever eaten. It's just warm and sweet and chickeny and it's the biscuit and the honey and the butter and all that business, great. But that's not, there's plenty of times where you don't get that. And the chicken's been out in the, under uh, the heat lamp too long or the- or it's that scrawny chicken. <laughs> or it's a scrawny chicken and you're just sort of like, oh, this is just Or the bun. Disgusting. Or the, the biscuit has been out too long. The biscuit's been out, yeah. It's all crumbly yeah. and mm -hmm. it's like, ah. It's a gamble, you know? It's just the gamble that you take, you know? That's why, you know, I don't, you know, I don't eat them every day, just like a couple of, once every couple of months. But yeah. But, you know, what are you this is do? the price we pay for uh, comfort. Well, it's the price that you pay for the opera. It's like a lottery, yeah. right? It's what it is. It's a, it's like a mouth lottery. Mm -hmm. It's a sensation lottery yeah. in that you, because you're not eating the HBCB for its nutritional value, because it's... <laughs> hardly any right like we would have gotten like just I don't know plain eggs and a tortilla or something you know but uh yeah you know it, uh, it's not uh you eat it because it you know it makes you feel something it has a sensation to it so it's a sensation lottery yeah there you go it's all fast food is anyway <laughs>